So, my name is Courtney, for all that uh, don't know. Um, and what we will do today is fortify a very sought, sought after position by the, the, the Queen's empire. And that, amongst many, uh, and that position is in, in the human mind. Right. It's the, the queen's intention to go in the human mind and kill off what I would uh, coin as the desire uh, of mankind to seek that which is true or that which is unknown. <clears throat> Without this desire, um, if it's killed off, mankind uh, becomes a merely a deductive logical beast that it that is subjected to um, whatever the environment around mankind throws at him or her. <clears throat> so you become, you know, uh, become swayed by things like tornadoes and natural disasters, uh, what do you call it? Uh, big gigantic rocks from outer space, um, so on and so forth. So what we're gonna do is fortify, fortify that position um, by um, investigating a 2400 year problem. And that problem is the doubling of the line uh, the square and the cube as one. We probably won't um, exhaust the cube just for time's sake, uh, but we will set up set up the problem of doubling the cube. <clears throat> just to just to set the stage, um, we're gonna uh, look at something from Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it's called the Purloin Letter. Has anybody read that? familiar with the story? Well, I'm just going to set it up a little bit, and then Daniel and I are going to read, you know, some lines from the, the first, from the opening of that. Um, basically, the, the story is set in the 1800s in France, in Paris, and there are three principal characters in the story, and it deals with uh, the taking of a political document of sorts um, from the person of a, of, a, of a dignitary in a hotel. And this, the taking of this letter by this individual is used for you know, political power and whatnot. So the knowledge of the person that the letter was taken from, uh, the knowledge of that person knowing that who took the letter um, actually gives this, this, the person that took the letter, you know, a certain edge or a certain power in, from a political standpoint. Um, so the interaction is between the narrator, um, a man named Dupin, um, and the prefect of the Parisian police. Um, and what we're going to do what, we're gonna, what Daniel and I are going to do is read the opening to give you guys a sense of the interaction here. So I'll, I'll be reading um, the narrator and the um, and the prefect, the head of police intelligence. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. There it is. And it's up here, so you guys can read along. Oh yeah, 
this it picks up this play. I mean, this uh, this short story is chronologically in time. It comes after another story that Poe writes. It's called the, the the murder in the Rue Morgue. So this is what what goes on in that story is what um, is referred to right off the bat here. <clears throat> so. Basically, the, the prefect is arriving at a location where the narrator and Mr. Dupont are you know, sitting together having a smoke of, of tobacco in their, their pipes and whatnot, and having various discussions. <clears throat> so, and what is the difficulty now, I ask? There's nothing more the assassination way I hope. Oh no, nothing of that nature. The fact is, the business is very simple indeed, and I make no doubt that we can manage it sufficiently well ourselves. But then I thought Dupont would like to hear the details of it because it is so excessively odd. Simple and odd, said Dupont. Why, yes, and not exactly that either. The fact is, we have all been a good deal puzzled because the affair is so simple and yet baffles us altogether. Perhaps it is the very simplicity of the thing which puts you at fault. What nonsense do you talk? <laughs> Perhaps the mystery is a little too plain. <laughs> oh, good heavens, who ever heard of such an idea? A little too self-evident. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Work uh, roared our visitor, profoundly amused. Oh, Dupin, you'll be the death of me yet. <laughs> and then they, you know, a little bit of discussion transpires, and then we arrive at this second part. You might have spared yourself this trouble, said Dupin. D, I presume, is not altogether a fool, and if not, must have anticipated these waylayings as a matter of course. Not altogether a fool, but then he's a poet, which I take to be only one removed from a fool. Hmm. True. Although I have been guilty of certain doggerel myself. Suppose you detail the particulars of your source. Why, the fact is, we took our time, and we searched everywhere. I have had long experience in these affairs. I took the entire building, room by room, devoting the nights of a whole week to each. We examined first the furniture of each apartment. We opened every possible drawer, and I presume you know that, to a properly trained police agent, such a thing as a secret drawer is impossible. Any man is a dolt who permits a secret drawer to escape him in a search of this kind. The thing is so plain, there is a certain amount of bulk of space to be accounted for in, e in every cabinet. Then we have accurate rules. The 50th part of a line could not escape us. After the cabinets, we took the chairs. The cushions we probed with the fine long needles you have seen me employ. From the tables, we removed the tops. And then he goes on and he describes, he, they use these really strong microscopes. This is all in search of this letter um, to, you know, to, to survey every single page of every book that, that is on the premises, you know, in search of this letter. Um, they cut off, you know, they just dissect chairs and look in the, the holes of tables and they take the tops off of it. They even, and they do this not only in the hotel, the main hotel where this thing happened, they do it in the building next door to the hotel, to the left, and also to the right. So they, they, they launched this very extensive search, and it still didn't, and it, it, it still eluded them how they could possibly find this letter. So I want you guys to keep, keep that in mind, and we'll come back, we'll come back to this, um, 
after we have a little bit of fun on the whiteboard here. All right, so you can have a seat. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, so. If So if I ask you guys to, you had a line of some, some length, any line, no line. If I ask you to double that line, how would you, how would you do it? Double it? Mm-hmm. No. Oh, oh. You, you'd have to draw the same length, extended, mm -hmm. the same amount of length, and, and then it would be doubled. Right. It would be twice the size right. that the original line. Right. Does anybody disagree? But there's no, there's no right answer. We will, we will, we will enter a domain where there are wrong answers, but this is pretty simple and straightforward. Are you asking how you would do it, or yeah, how would you, how would you generate? Uh, Your recipe? Yeah. This. Line. How did you make this into two of itself? You mean so that it, it would be on the board there for you? Yeah. Measure it. Measure it. Measure it. And then line it up with the end and, and draw the same. Alright, what about what about rotation? I your rotation is a piece of string. Right. A compass of some sort? So First part, that was easy. We doubled the line. Yay! <laughs> One third away. Um, uh, for me, that would be easy. Being a former draftsman, I would take my compass and I would get both points four and a half and switch it over to this side, put a dot, draw the line over. And that right. You may not be familiar with that. Sounds pretty straightforward. So this is what you would call um, the simply extended. If you keep that, just um, it's too difficult. Just keep in mind if you have a notepad right now. This is the, the I'll keep saying it as we go on. Um, So the, the next step is the, a very ancient problem in geometry. Uh, it's, the, it's that of the doubling of the square. Um, and it's actually the subject, that problem is a kind of sub-subject of, of uh, one of Plato di Plato's dialogues called the Mino where in the Mino, it starts off with Mino posing a question to Socrates. Um, and that question is, it says, uh, Socrates, um, is, is knowledge um, to be learned or is it to be 
recollected. Right? That's a rough paraphrase. And so Plato, in order to prove that knowledge is, is recollect, recollected and not taught, and this goes to a more extensive argument of immortality of the soul of Plato's, um, um, he actually takes a, one of Mino's slave or servants, slaves, um, a slave boy, he, he actually midwives a discovery of how you are to double the square, double the area of the square with this slave boy to, to prove that the slave boy didn't get taught how to do that, but he, he recollected, he remembered how to, how to do it, how to double the square. And this goes to, just to give a little bit of context, this goes to Plato's argument of the immortality of the soul, that, um, that knowledge is, is that your, your soul is, just kind of forgets um, the answers to problems like this um, throughout eternity. <clears throat> so, I'll pose a question to you. You have a square. That's if that's a square. <laughs> Excuse me. You have a square with the area of one. And if, you, if you've ever, I'll just put this out there, if you've been through this particular problem, and you, you, you know the answer, don't shout it out. <laughs> but if you don't know the answer and you think you do, you can shout it out. <laughs> but if you know for a fact you know, you know this answer, don't. That's a good question. That's actually part of the subject of, of this presentation. How do you know when you know something to be true or false? So you have a, a square with the area of one. In the same way that I ask you to generate um, another line that was equal to the, the first line, the double the line, I want you to, I want people to hypothesize on how they would generate a square with the area of two. What would you do? What? How would you? What would be the first step at generating a doubled square here? Anybody have any ideas? Hmm? Oh, double the side. Oh, flip. Double the side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so double the side. We'll just do it this way. Right? But what happens? What happens when you double the side? You're, you're doubling the side on all sides, right? Yeah. Right, so something funny happens. You get a square with the area of four. Right? So right off the bat, you're 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 faced with with the fact that you can't rely on uh, the same the same thing that you did to double the line. Because that, isn't that what it was? We, we doubled the line. We doubled the side, each side. It's interesting that something Daniel showed earlier about Lynn talking about you know, the perfusion and so forth, the parallel courses of inquiry. Mm -hmm. so that information can be shared and so forth. Because in this case, even though it's an incorrect hypothesis, 
it doesn't mean it's not useful right. to find the ultimate answer. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I would just throw out there, I was, I was uh, intending on someone to give that, that answer. I knew someone would, would answer in that way. It was part, if, and if they didn't answer that way, I was going to pose it. <laughs> so, be that as it may, we still don't have a square with the area of two on here. We have one, and we have fours. Anybody else have any other ideas of how we can get to a square with the area of two? Socrates at no point. No, but you should throw the square and see maybe it is double. Throw the square, I, I said. Okay. And it, is it okay after it's thrown again, you show why you think it might be? No. You know, you, you know the, whole, the whole thing already. You know, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. This one? Uh, and then this, from, from this way too? Well, uh, Want to take off and, and dry yourself? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. They have too many lines. I'll try that. Right. So you had it before. Oh, you had it like like this. Okay. And then I said, okay, do it like that. Right. And that. Right. And then this. square and then the side would be one and a half. This whole thing? Yeah, that, that I shaded it. Well there's only one there's only one problem. But it's well what do you think it is? How big is it? It's not a square. Well but I'm saying like if if it really was no it would be a square because this would be one and one and a half, and this would be one, one and a half, and this would right. be one. So it is a square because the so way we. So what you have to do is you have to say, you know, oh. you have to say. Oh, what? it's on this side too. So right. One and a half. So what's the volume? So yeah, what's the volume? Yeah. If you multiply what's, that. What's the area? Yeah. Well, okay. let's see. I don't know. Could you tell by the picture <laughs> what the area is without multi without multiplying? You did not multiply. Well, you really could, because then you have this one, and then this is half, and this is half, and that's a quarter. So you have this, you have a quarter too much. No, he figured out himself that <laughs> I'm wrong. So you got to look at one and eight. Yeah. When you go through the amino but it's close. too, yeah. it's not that it's, it's not specific. Times, it's not that it's specifically measured. You have to be able to demonstrate, to prove geometrically, without yeah. some kind of fine You're right. you know, measurement. Yeah. It was without numbers. It was without yeah. numbers. Yeah. All right. So. Somebody had to do it. 
And yet, you're on the right, you're on the right track, though. Anybody else have a different way to, that they would go about constructing, constructing a, a, like he wanted to do? He wanted to construct. Now, now I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it occurs to me that the right that the the square of all, of area two is in between the size of the square of area one and the square of area four, right? Yeah, this is a question of a geometric mean. So if it's in between the two. So what's yeah. what's the, the the geometric mean between one and two is what you're looking for. That's what the, that's what you're searching. The, the side of the square that has an area of two is the geometric <coughs> mean between one and two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, oh, no, no, one and two. Mm -hmm. The area, mm -hmm. the area of the square of two is the geometric mean between one and four. So. You're saying one, one is this question sign um, as question sign is the two. Mm. And then the area would be mm -hmm. one, one is to two as two is to four. These are both geometric means. Opposed to an arithmetic mean, people know what arithmetic mean is? Well, the, an, an arithmetic mean is like if, if you would add up a whole series of numbers, let's say you add up 75 mm -hmm. times, An average. and then you divide five into that product, that mm -hmm. would be the mean, the arithmetic right. mean of the whole Right. Of all those numbers, you know. Or that that's an arithmetic mean. Yeah, right. Not, not geometry or anything. Opposed to this type of this type of mean. <clears throat> I would offer something interesting to what you said though. I mean we're looking and I think you mentioned we're not looking at numbers in the Mino dialogue, right? No mention mm -hmm. of numbers. So Howard tried to do something using physical geometry, using the idea of maybe properties. Mm -hmm. Of squares, or right, right. you know, just just looking and thinking through what you're looking so, at. So maybe the idea of looking at an idea within the relationship of the one square to the four squares right. would allow you to think through an idea that would give you an answer that even though you couldn't measure it, you would know it would be correct just by looking at the relationships of lines and area and things like that. So we, we, we dealt, let's, let's, try to, let's try to construct this. We dealt with drawing horizontal and vertical lines. Are there any other types of lines that we left out that we can? Yeah. Diagonals. Diagonals. Okay, I want somebody to, to try to do what, what's your name again? Howard. Howard, I want someone to do what Howard just tried to do, but with diagonals. Try to. You can direct. I'll do anything you direct me to do except draw on somebody else. <laughs> uh -oh. Anything pop out? Where should we put our first diagonal? Yeah. Or did you just on the other side? I can't see it. Yeah, not transparent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be in trouble with anybody. <laughs> Right. So we're, we're trying to create a square that is one half the area of the larger square. Right. Which, which is double the original of the first square. So a square, the square that's half the area of the large square and double the area of the first square. And it's between. It's a, it's a geometric mean between both those two squares stated. 
So is there a way that you could use diagonals mm -hmm. to create half of maybe the square that's four times the area, provably, of the original square, thereby achieving your objective? Who? Dissect each of those four squares with a diagonal, and that will create your. If my if my drawing was a perfect square, it wouldn't look like a diamond. What do you call those things? Rhomboids? Rhombuses? So there you have it. I'm going to redraw it all. See why that is the case? That's four times. The big one is four times the original. Yes. So half and half and half and half is two times. Mm -hmm. bear, bear with my drawing here. So that's the same, that's the same square. Square. <laughs> square-like figure that we had in the middle here. Y'all see that? We have one half, one half, and in this greater square here, you have four of those halves, mm -hmm. therefore a square of two. <clears throat> you can actually You can actually do it again. So what would the area of this, this square be? If we just continue, continue this process, where you double this square, and then you do the same thing to the bigger one. something if you continue to if you continue the, the doubling in this way you have something that that's called a that's generated called a self-similar process it's like a you know a snail shell how a snail shell grows or even our galaxy is a spiral sorry is a spiral galaxy and grows in a self-similar way is that the universal code of mathematics? Huh? Is that the universal code for mathematics? The universal what? Code for mathematics. Code for mathematics. Because what, what you're doing right there is, is, is in everything that's on the planet. Yeah, I was just pointing out uh, the fact that it's, things in nature actually grow in this way. Right, okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm posing nothing else uh, other than that. Though it may, what you're saying it may be, but I don't, 
I don't claim to know that that is true. Um, so here you have the length of one. I'm just going to pose what this length is, and you guys can figure out why it is that. Uh, this is this, the side of the square with the area of two is the square root of two. This is two. This is two square root two. So this is just the, the generation of uh, geome a, a, a specific type of geometric mean. The, the circle itself expresses a more, uh, I would say, universal <coughs> mode of generating uh, geometric means. And I'll show you what's the, what, you what I mean. What's the square root of two? What is that? What is that? It's a, we call it, and isn't it called an imaginary number? It's irrational. Irrational number, I'm sorry. But what uh -huh. sign is, what, uh, what is it? Oh, it's part of the circle? It's part of that curve. Oh, it's, it's a part of the curve? Or the, uh, no, no, no. The, curve. the red, I, I highlight a, a line, specific lines in red. This, the first line is one. The second line, square root of two. The, th uh, the third line is two. The fourth line is two root two square root two. And the fifth line is four. Four. Going back to the original philosophical study for this in Plato. Is, is, one of the, is he trying to say that intrinsically or as part of the mind of uh, counting is intrinsic to the mind? Is he trying to, what, what statement is, is being made here about the mind as a relation to this? Is he saying that counting is intrinsic to the mind? Is no, he, he's saying that he's merely, he doesn't use any of these numbers. He probably uses like four and one and eight and things like that. But he's merely trying to prove that the slave boy recollects this, the, per, this, the first part of the, the proof of the doubling of the square. By recollects it means it's somehow already embedded in his mind. Yeah, and he just has to Go back to what, what you said. He was, he was getting on to before that everyone has the ability of counting. Right. And that if you set it up the right way, you can count the, the triangles without knowing anything about the square root of two. Because you, can, you know that the area is double by just looking at it yeah. and, and splitting it up and counting without yeah. knowing anything. Yeah. That's well, hence what he did. I, I mean, I just wanted to point out that the way, I think what's key in this is the concept that, I, and what, what Courtney's laid out here, that, that it takes place in the course of a dialogue. What LaRouche has repeatedly returned to in terms of the problem with education today is that it is repeat after me, right? And you know, when I was teaching, I did a lot of that because they, they give you these they give you these textbooks, and you're supposed to with your like six year old say, okay, so what's well, you know what's this sound? What's this sound make? What's that sound make? What's this sound make? Phonics, basically, other stuff like that. It's just row memorization. What Socrates does with the slave boy is a dialogue. All he does is ask the slave boy questions. 
He never tells the slave boy what the answer is. The slave boy has to use his own mind and compare what he sees before him with the truth that exists in the mind. Because Plato, like Cusa and Kepler, say that whatever you're doing, when you're comparing whether something is true, you're looking at a proportion that is sensible, that is sort of like made up of terms that are in the world, and you're comparing it to the truth that's in your own mind, to a, that, that the terms, the actual terms of uh, real perfect harmony, like the circle, the perfect circle exists within the mind and not in the sensible universe. And this is a proof of the reality of ideas, in a sense, and of the reality of the mind as primary. Mm -hmm. That the universe, in fact, works in a lawful, truthful, right. and knowable way, right. and your mind is equipped to decipher that, to, right. demonstrate, to recognize and to be able to demonstrate that. Well, well, but if, if you draw an actual circle on the board, whatever whatever size it is, w wouldn't you have a perfect circle there? It, it wouldn't be only in the mind. You you could draw a, a, a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. If you if you draw an actual circle, which is really a circle, then that's perfect. That there there's well. no. Well, the, Need for improvement, well, the concept of circle is what is where the concept of circle is what where the perfection is. It's not the river, the manifestation in the on the whiteboard that's perfect. So the fact that you can I can say circle and everybody thinks of a circle and probably can draw a circle is what makes it yeah. universal. But you, you can't yeah. make it more perfect. The, a circle is a circle. Yeah. They, you, you can't get more perfect yeah. than that. But what I'm trying to bring out is I, I respect what Daniel said, but it, it's not only in the mind. You can actually draw an actual circle yeah. on the blackboard and it would be a perfect circle. But this is the whole, this is the whole, does it, uh, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> yeah, but Ideas. the problem is it has to, it's in the mind first. It's not just jumping onto the whiteboard without you putting it there. Oh, so it's, okay. It's, it's, it's manifest in your mind it, first. It, You're not trying to say it's perfect or not perfect, and you can draw a perfect circle once you think about what a circle is. But you have to think first. You yeah, interestingly. Say, it doesn't just jump on the by itself. What's in, your mind. What's, in your, what's in your mind is not, it's not that you see an image of a circle in your mind. What you know is a circle is a, is a concept. You could, you, you, I challenge you very directly to draw a perfect circle. I don't think that anyone, no one can draw a perfect circle. Well, well wait a minute. If, uh, if one draws an ellipse, for example, and that's an ellipse, not a circle. But this is, we all know what a circle is. Whatever size you draw it, if you draw it accurately, you, you understand and that it's that? a circle, that, then it's a perfect circle. There's no, there's no such thing as less of a circle, or you could make it more perfect on, you know, on the corner. A, a circle is a circle. And if you okay. draw it correctly, let's, let's not, let's not get too circular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. 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 We don't want to go in circles about the circle because well, no, no. you get dizzy. <laughs> You've been on a merry-go-round before. I mean, but you can't make it so <laughs> more. If you draw it correctly, oh, well. it's a circle <laughs> and it's perfect. You, know, you can't perfect it anymore. And yeah. it's also in the mind. Well, Kusa, Kusa, Kusa has an idea, and this is not a part of what I plan to go on, but it's, it's good. Uh, Kusa has an, uh, Nicholas of Kusa uh, has this idea of, he has this analogy that he makes uh, with polygons and a circle um, in order he makes it, he uses this analogy of polygons in a circle, like for instance, you have your circle, 
and then you have your your polygons that are um, inscribed in the circle. And he says that man, man is in terms of man uh, being measured up to God, or how close man is to God in terms of his being, is like how you can continuously add sides to the polygon, ad infinitum, but you'll never get up to, you never add enough sides to, to get to the circle. And the circle, the circle is his analogy for God. And the, the polygon and the sides being added is man trying to measure up to God. And in the same way, you can say that every circle that this imperfect being man tries to draw is, um, no matter how perfect it is, no, no matter how precise the, the uh, compass, the, the, you know, the equipment that you're using to generate a circle is, uh, you will never achieve. achieve the perfection of the actual, the concept of circle. Though we partake in, uh, just like the God, the example of God, it's not. This is not to say that we can, we'll never be as good as God or the Creator. Um, but it's, it's to define a, in a sense, a permanent or eternal mission to strive to be um, perfect in terms of from a godly standpoint, not in terms of neatness or something. So that, oh, that would be a mistake. Excuse me, are there any people out there, like groups of students or professors that are into this uh, frame of thought that are actually uh, really applying it? Uh, only us. We have a, we're going to be putting on the cadre school, which is the concept of teachers teaching teachers. We're going to be bringing young people um, down for a weekend of this type of discourse. Young? Yeah, young people. What about, uh, uh, how about you? What about old people? Mature? Wisdom? Well, I say that because you asked if, is there any camp, you know, are there any campuses uh, anywhere uh, that, that, that do this type of work? No, there isn't, and we're trying to grow it, and that, that is why. So yeah, go to the, go to the lower, you know, not lower, but uh, the younger folks. The older folks can definitely sponsor someone, some younger person to come, with an understanding that 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 these ideas have to be uh, carried on into the future to define. An adequate, adequate future for mankind. Um, so to continue, we left off on the fact that the doubling of the square defines a certain. Uh, in order to double the square, you have to find uh, the, the the mean between one and two, the geometric mean. But that's a specific case. Uh, the circle itself, since we're talking about circles, um, actually allows you to generate any, any type of geometric mean between any two extremes. And I'll just draw, draw that. And that's why I could have doubled that square easily with a pair of dividers <laughs> mechanically. <laughs> and I would have been precise. So. Do you challenge that? I don't challenge you at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's coming from a gentleman with a lot of mind. And, and, and Don, I'm surprised you didn't answer it. I do not doubt your capabilities. Um, so real quick, assuming that this is... So if this is so if this is P, 
your mean, your geometric mean will always be uh, represented by this, this length here. And if people can imagine if this triangle was being determined and these lengths were being determined by where P is on, on the circumference, how, you know, if you move it over here, P would be, you know, or P, let's say, P O A. P O would get smaller as you, you pull P around here and P A would get longer as you did that, right? And then it'd be the opposite as you went over that direction. So as you can see, if this is the mean, the geometric mean um, between OB and BA. And this is something, everything that I'm putting forth here, you don't have to really, you don't have to get right now at this moment. You can take notes and you can embark on this, on this mission um, <laughs> on your own time, to the extent that you have free time. <laughs> Right? So, one of Plato's collaborators, Archytas, gives a treatment for the next step in our, in our three-step journey here, where we double the line and then we, we double the square. The next step is the doubling of the cube. And Archytas, Archytas his, his, his treatment of the doubling of the cube depended upon uh, finding two means between two extremes. Whereas with the doubling of the square, you only have to find one. Right? So what happened? What would happen if you if you double the area of a square? I mean the, the area of a cube that had one. What would happen? If you had blocks, and I wish we had blocks that little kids play with. But you had some type of blocks, and you had to... <clears throat> Would they go into, uh, into sketching? They go into like one dimensional, two dimensional? Well, we've already, yeah, this is, the question, it's good you brought that up. The, where we were doubling, the domain that we were doubling the square in is what you can call a, a doubly extended domain or 2D, two-dimensional. <clears throat> I believe it was Re, either Riemann or Gauss that um, used, used the, the term simply extended, doubly extended, and the cube triply, triply extended. Um, but let me give you a. a, a so is this um, within the first part of the doubling? Is that um, consistent with uh, what's in what we call when we study in this school plane geometry or Euclidean geometry? Yeah, right. The, the simply, the simply, I mean, the doubly extended plane is the two dimensional, yeah. and that that is plane. Plane geometry. Yeah. That would be you would find those same, um, not in the same way, I don't think, because Euclid was not. Um, well, Euclid wouldn't have been able to find, he wouldn't have been able, wouldn't have been able to double the cube. The cube, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but the square. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, but also a question that Dan was bringing up, um, even if, again, applying to Euclid, plane geometry in the textbooks, the question is how do you incite this one method that Plato describes here, Socrates, where the, 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 the structure uh, does not get the answer, but uh, does a little prompting and the student actually solves the problem, right? Compared, it's a method. Compared to Euclid, 
where the textbook may have the right answer. No, I know it just starts with all the rules. So yeah, right. All of the, uh, it doesn't start out yeah. with the dialogue, it starts out saying the right. line is the point, so the point is, 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 is that with no extension. Yeah, right. all those crazy yeah. definitions that break down, actually. So those rules are right. 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 Correct. Yeah. So so where, do you, where, where can you find in the physical universe a point that has no breadth, width, or depth? Depth, excuse me. And then the line is, the line is defined by two of those points, imaginary points that have no physical existence, you know, so, and then the, the, uh, the square, so on and so forth, is made up of lines. We build up. Uh, one of our kind of senior science mind, great minds in our organization, um, Bruce the Rector, says that a lot of the modern deductionists Math, uh, deductionists or reductionist mathematicians are, uh, how do you say it, more, or that Euclid is actually less, is more anti, more anti Euclidean than some of these modern mathematicians. Because you can take Euclid's elements and read it and go backwards from a certain point, and you can get a certain, you can get something out of it. It's not that it's a book full of untruths. It's just the, the, the method um, in which it's written is, is, is wrong. <clears throat> the idea that the universe is composed of these, these definitions, these axioms. <clears throat> So here, yeah, we've gotten to the cube. All right, so it's called the, the, the famous name is the Delian problem. The Delian, as in the people of Delos. And the, the story goes that um, around Plato's time, actually, the people of Delos, the island of Delos, were being ravaged and decimated utterly by a plague. You know, people were dying. And the reasoning was that, or the, the reasoning of the Oracle of Delphi was that um, they had they had made they had angered one of the gods. I, I from the story that I remember was uh, Apollo was Apollo that Apollo was unleashed this plague because he was he was angry that the Delians hadn't built a, an altar to worship them adequately. And uh, when they, okay, okay so the, the people went to the, the oracle and said, okay, how do we stop this plague? The oracle told that story to them and said, the only way you can stop, you know, from this plague from just killing you guys off is if you double the size of your altar to worship Apollo, which happened to be a cube. So Plato actually, his, his, his analysis of that, of that problem was that this was the God, this was God's um, way of saying, look, you guys are, you guys are effing up as a people, you have to, you should start taking up problems like doubling the cube in a sense regularly as a as a as a cultural um, remedy to what brought about this this uh, this play or this societal collapse. And that was Plato's analysis roughly. <clears throat> No, this is just a story for me. <laughs> this is a question. Yes, sir. You said uh, before that you can't get a perfect circle. Right. Wrong. Yes, sir. Absolutely wrong. In spherical trigonometry, you get a proof of a perfect circle is where the radius relative to the center is the same at all points on the circle. Well, 
you'd have to you'd have, you'd have to prove that and come back and show us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not willing to take your word for that. You can show us mathematically. Now the thing is, part of our people five minutes from hope. For the whole thing? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you gotta move fast. Okay. I, I, mean, I, hear, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Um, you should put together a proof and come okay. back. But we don't. We don't. We gotta move on. Sorry. Um, so what you have to do? I'm just gonna give you a couple of things. Um, in order to double the square, if you if you didn't understand that when we when uh. Um, Say your name, Trevor. Sorry, when Trevor very brill brilliantly actually proved it with his diagonals, um, you should go back through. You should work back through that. <coughs> you find the mean between one and two. Um, and what I'll leave you on the doubling of the cube problem is you have to you have to find two means between two extremes. Because when you double when you double the size of, of, of when you double the volume of the cube with one, you immediately go to eight. The volume of a double cube of one is eight, right? So what you have to find is two means that lie between one and eight, right? And just another difference I'll I'll go over is that in the doubling in the lower in the double eight extended manifold per se. Of the, of the you know, two-dimensional, you have to work your way up from one to eight. With the cube in the triply extended uh, manifold or dimension for 3D, it only takes one process of doubling and you create one to eight just in one shot. You create two means from the top down rather, rather than having to build up because what I left out is that you can you can actually you can fudge you can fudge uh, two means between two extremes in the flat plane, but it doesn't really give you the the, uh, the side that you need um, of a double Q, right? And this this goes to this whole thing, which is kind of a shadow um, lurking. In, in the whole problem per se, and that, that, that shadow is represented by a curve that's generated when you try to, when you actually try to finagle in the flat plane um, these two extremes. So remember how we were, we had, you know, determined, oops, see, it's right there, determined that this is the mean between these two extremes, no matter where uh, P is. You can actually gener generate another set of extreme, I mean another set of similar uh, relations if you project, if you make this projection here. I'm going real fast now. Um, if you, with this new projection, the shadow that lurks is defined by when you move P around, you have this point here, this would also move. It would draw out uh, a curve. That specific curve is a, a, represent, a representation of something called negative curvature. It's a, a, a curve that curves in two directions. Can you step back? Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm. It's a curve that curves in two directions, so so it can't be it can't be uh, adequately represented in the in this manifold here that we're that we're that we're this very manifold that we're using right now the doubly extended. <clears throat> so the the length that you're looking for um, in order to double the cube. Is, is in order to, to, to get it, you have to properly define the relationship of this length here to these two. But once again, this length de defines a curve that 
is a shadow of a higher, of a higher power, of a higher domain, power, uh, a higher power. I, I know it sounds weird when I said that, but I'm not going to pull my punches. I'm sorry, you said define the length between these two. Could you just go back um, to that? These that two point? extremes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is A, O, B. So, and this is G. <clears throat> extremes meaning the end point of those, uh, that time, or? Uh, yeah, these two lengths. So there's a point where, there's a point where you can put P over, like way over here, and this would make B O that small and O A that big. I was thrown off because they look like it was the same. Yeah, right. And you say double the Q, then you double the sign. No, oh, double the volume. Because we already we already ran when we when we tried when we first tried to double the square, right? The first thing that you came up yes was the just doubling the side, yeah. Right? Just extending what we had done in the lower dimension. So each time you move to a higher uh, higher ordered uh, manifold, you have to that comes with a new you have to make a new hypothesis, right? So, which brings me to uh, the, it's not, we have to read one more. We didn't read all of those last time, did we? First two. Oh, we got okay. first two. Okay. People with me? <laughs> okay. We're moving. Roughly, roughly. So, okay. So people remember the story that I was telling before the uh, purloined letter. Yeah, right. We're going to conclude that. Um, so the the the, pre, the the prefect goes over how he where we left off, how he, um, how he was searching. Yeah, how he was searching, letter. right? Yeah. And he couldn't find it, right? And DuPont, DuPont had proposed that maybe it was the very simplicity that allude, you know, alluded the prefect and the whole uh, uh, Paris police department from finding this one little letter. Um, and the prefect had um, said, "No, that's not possible. It couldn't, you know what you're talking about. You know, this guy was a, you know, the guy that stole the letter was a poet. So that means he's a fool, right? <laughs> so, anyways, you guys should read this, read it um, as a whole if you haven't. All right, I'm confusing All right, yeah. Conclusion." Uh, I think that's you. The Parisian police are exceedingly able in their way. They are persevering, ingenious, cunning, and thoroughly versed in the knowledge which their duties seem chiefly to demand. Thus, when G detailed to us his mode of searching the premises at the hotel, I felt entire confidence in his having made a satisfactory investigation, so far as his labor is extended. So far as his labor is extended, yes. said I? Yes. The measures adopted were not only the best of their kind, but carried out to absolute perfection. Had the letter been deposited within the range of their search, these fellows would, beyond a question, have found it. Hmm. I merely laughed. <laughs> but he seemed quite serious in all that he said. The measures, then were good in their kind and well executed. Their defect lay in their being inapplicable to the case and to the man. A certain set of highly ingenious resources are, with the prefect, a sort of procrust procrustean bed to which he forcibly adapts his designs. And the identification 
of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent depends, if I understand you aright, upon the accuracy of, if I understand you, upon the accuracy with which the opponent's intellect is, is ad admeasured. For its practical value, it depends upon this. And the prefect and his cohort fail so frequently, first, by default of this identification, and secondly, by ill admeasurement, or rather through non-admeasurement, of the intellect with which they are engaged. They consider only their own ideas of ingenuity, and in searching for everything hidden, advert only to the modes in which they, they would have hidden it. They are right in this much, that their own ingenuity is a faithful representative of that of the mass. But when the cunning of the individual felon is diverse in character from their own, the felon foils them, of course. This always happens when it is above their own, and very usually when it is below. They have no variation of principle in their investigations. At best, when urged by some unusual emergency, by some extraordinary reward, they extend or exaggerate their old modes of practice without touching their principles. So, so mankind has to actually, as a whole, has to actually touch its principles. Um, if you look at, if you look at what uh, Lyndon LaRouge defines as energy, energy uh, flux density, moving from wood to coal as a, as a society, from coal to fossil fuels, from fossil fuels to the nuclear powers, and from the nuclear powers to matter or antimatter. If, you, if we remain in any one of those modes and we just merely extend our habits, we're gonna, we're gonna fail. Just like you saw in the part, every time where we, we try to extend, well, in the one case, where you try to extend the line, um, you fail, right? In the case of the doubling of the cube, you try to double the cube, I mean, double the square by doubling its side. In other words, by doing the same thing that you did in the lower domain, the simply extended manifold to double the line in a higher manifold. So we're, we're, we're <coughs> as, as a society, we're, we're faced with um, a similar problem. And hopefully this, this moment here that I spent with you guys will help us be able to, as a, as a unit, be able to overcome uh, the adversity that we see ourselves coming up against in this time. So that's what I'll say. You see that thing from 